Welcome to the Creative Block. I'm Vince Gonzalez. Uh, we're here today with filmmaker and composer Vincent Walker and Yaron Eigenstein. Um, Vincent is a filmmaker based in Los Angeles, raised in Detroit. He studies folklore and film production at USC School of Cinematic Arts, where, he's, where he also teaches production. He's drawn to drama, animation, and the exploration of cinema that explores unconventional human experiences. Yaron is a composer, music producer, orchestrator, and arranger. He is a graduate of the prestigious Screen Scoring Masters program at the University of Southern California. He is also the founding member of Kulu, Kulu Lam, a social musical initiative aimed at empowering communities. Um, welcome, guys. I appreciate you guys making the time this morning to be here. I have to apologize. There might be a little, there's a little bit of construction going on outside, so apologize for it not being a completely dead room. Um, but we're here today because I saw a screening, I think beginning of January or so, uh, featuring several, several AI produced films um, uh, utilizing AI. Uh, Vincent, you screened your film 24 Frames of Detroit. Uh, that included uh, Yaron's score, uh, like others, this film incorporated uh, AI. Um, and it, to me, feels like a haunting love letter to Detroit. Uh, it includes a static-ish uh, scenes depicting raw and lonely streets uh, uh, at, the, at the ground level, many of them. And uh, Yaron's score includes really just sort of ghostly musical sounds and effects. Um, in the final picture and sound, both of them together, your partnership uh, is really pure art using uh, AI. Um, uh, is that a fair description of, of uh, uh, your film, it's, Vincent? It's one of the better ones. So I'll say, <laughs> I'll say uh, you know, first of all, it was a pleasure working with um, Yaren on this. Thank you. Um, it was, uh, I just want to give some context though. Um, yeah, it was a film that at the beginning of it, at the beginning of this process, I knew I wanted to showcase Detroit through memory um, by using, you know, this new tool of AI image generation. I think one of the, one of the, I don't know if you've heard anything yet, Yaren, but um, people have been coming up to me saying, oh yeah, I loved your film. It was uh, depressing. <laughs> that is, that's the that's the one word that's been trailing this film. Um, I would disagree strongly. <laughs> no, but, no, that's why I said the haunting. It, haunting might be a better word for it. Um, but it, uh, I agree in the sense that you know it is a very ghostly and and surreal kind of uh, film project that was completely. Uh, it, it it jumped it jumped into the stratosphere of 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 beauty when when the com the composition was added onto it so yeah i think that was a good description of it so vincent i wanted to mention the opening title card in your film is a quote from sure. iranian film director uh abbas uh abbas kia rotami if i'm saying that right yeah, um, yeah. and and it reads, I've often noticed that we are not able to look at what we have in front of us unless it's inside a frame. Correct. And when I thought about that, the obvious is photo frame, picture frame, but I, it almost made me think about perspective. Everybody has a frame in their perception about what life is. Uh, tell me about what it meant for you and why that was included. Wow. I Yeah, that that's a... Um very interesting point of view on that. I'd say, you know, first of all, this film is a is a direct um, allusion to his film. He, he's a filmmaker, um, Abbas, and uh, he created this, his final film before he passed was called 24 Frames. Um, and it was still images that he um, hid within a video uh, where things were moving. Um, but the idea was that one image um, within that video was a single still image. And the game, not the game, but the I guess the the meaning behind it was finding that one image and, and really just living with that process of creating 
a moving image, which again, the, the whole idea of 24 frames to begin with, which is this, this idea of all of cinema, which is 24 frames a second. He's this prolific filmmaker who I love and, and hold dear. I love all of his films and I sort of wanted to, to pay homage to that, but also I wanted to tie it back home. Um, so I went back and I decided to think of different ideas and areas and environments that I remember from home um, and sort of frame them in the context of, of emptiness, of stillness, um, which is part true and part untrue, you know, like it's like the truth, the true, the truth is Detroit is a ghost town in certain ways. Um, obviously people live there. I'm from there, you know, it's not completely empty, but it's a town that was meant for, that was built for millions and millions of people. Um, but after certain historical events that took place one after the other, um, it was eventually occupied by only hundreds of thousands of people, mostly black people. Um, so you have a city that you have a Mecca that was once coined the gem of Americana uh, because of its geographical positioning and its positioning with the lakes and and um, the border and there's just so much and the industries that were there the car industries and and the music industry there's so many industries that were present um, but but then it was sort of abandoned by um, by large swaths of people which left it feeling like you could ride your bike for mile, miles and not see anybody. Wow. So even though it looks like it should be occupied because you have all these buildings and abandoned properties. So it's, it's a beautiful, and at least the time when I grew up, it's a little bit different now. It's being gentrified and a lot of people are coming back and it's being reworked. But when I grew up, that's what it felt like as a kid. Um, I felt like I grew up in a huge gigantic city but it was definitely a small town energy due to the fact that you know you 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 knew the people around your area and that's kind of what created this sort of uh a lot of the gangs that were coming up was because they were all secluded into these pockets um even though we were part of a larger city so there's there's so much history and so much so much um you know sort of beautiful qualities to the city um, that that were in tandem with the dangers of it. And that's, I sort of wanted to reflect that just through my childhood memories. It's interesting because uh, there was a lot of familiarity in some ways for me when I saw it, because I grew up in South L.A. Okay. And uh, it, it, at the height of South L.A., Back in the day, and there's not that many people having conversations about this, but around the neighborhood I was in was really a hotbed for blues and jazz. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people would go through there that and then it, you know, there was white flight and then, you know, rentals and people weren't owning and we are where we are. And so a lot of that had a lot of f familiarity. It felt really honest when I saw it and not just somebody trying to depict something they thought it was. So I appreciate that very much. This question is actually for both of you guys. Um, why was it important to uh, think about AI in in creating this film? Interesting. Um, I'll I'll start. You know, I'm I'm not home, um, <laughs> so that's so that's one big part of it. You know, it, it allowed me to travel to do a travel shoot without having to travel, but. I would say, you know, I think, I think AI, <laughs> what's funny is that, you know, to some folks, they see me and they're like, oh, this is the AI guy. Cause you know, the, the film festival and I'm teaching it now and just all these other things, but I'm very much so uh, I'm stripping it down to the, to the point of this is a tool and I use it less and less um, purposefully because I think that it's honestly, the use cases are like, are very slim. There's like five good ones that I can review if, if you want to get bored. But um, the, so going through that process, I knew I wanted to create 
art, um, I wanted to have a hand in creating something that 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 was true, and and not um, and not just creating images for the sake of creating images. Um, I think I think a use case for this technology is tapping into what's in the artist's head. Like the best use of this stuff is not just um, typing in some random words like a dinosaur at a park or something. It's like, okay, what do you have in your head as an artist that you want to get out? Um, um, I'm not a good painter. I'm not a good drawer um, or sculptor, um, but I know how to shape an image. And so using this technology allowed me to, to have my hand in that and, and paint it. Um, and create it um, and get it on to a screen. So it was just important to to push push the boundaries of of this technology, which has a lot of boundaries, a lot of a lot of constrictions. Uh, and I just wanted to push it to see how far I can get it to to stay true to the vision that was in my head. That's amazing. And Yaron, did you have did you have a, a previous experience doing this? Uh, with AI, um, very yeah. limited. So this was uh, this is right at the beginning of when I started um, experimenting with with AI tools to create music. Uh, just to briefly touch though on on your uh, previous uh, question, I think it what's really interesting is you mentioned perspective, and um, you know at at its heart, like you said, this project is a love letter of a filmmaker to mm -hmm. the city he grew up in. And what what's interesting is it's all these visual depictions of memories. And like you said, uh, you know, some people can see it as haunting. Some people can see it as depressing. And what, <laughs> what was really important, I think, to the both of us was trying to really bring this perspective of, okay, you don't necessarily have to know where these places are. And you don't have to have the full picture of the context, of the physical context of these images. But we did want to give some sort of emotional context um, to try and give a frame to what Vincent's experience of these places actually was and what it was, what these memories actually mean to him and uh, what it was like growing up in these places and, and what it meant for you to, to grow up in this sort of ghost town, but, you know, to also paint that not necessarily in like an ominous tone, but in more of like, this was at times kind of like a massive playground you know, for you and your friends. And um, and I think AI is a really interesting tool to to achieve that kind of realization of memories because it really removes any form of intermediary between the memory and its visual realization. I mean, obviously, and I know you went through a lot of iterations to to get it to where to where it eventually got. And I know it was it was a it was a process, but if you think about it, it's it's kind of like describing a memory uh, to someone who has all the time in the world to keep revising until it's sort of where you want it to be. And what I found interesting to, uh, in terms of, of scoring and, and, and using AI for scoring is to sort of use AI tools to help me introduce a little bit of randomness and to sort of slightly remove myself uh, from mm -hmm. the process. Because I think what what's interesting about the you know, the concept of, of realizing memories is, I was trying to think, uh, what if we could sort of have the score be not necessarily sounding like the score itself, but if someone were trying to remember it, you know, instead mm. of, I, I would feed all these little bits of music into um, machine learning and instrument cloning and voice cloning tools, and just sort of see what it came up with. And if I could, you know, sort of use those little uh, tidbits and, uh, and yeah, it was it was really refreshing um, to to try and you know introduce something that that I I knew what I was inputting into it, but I didn't know what would come out of it. Yeah. Well, you know, I got to say it's really you know it's really beautiful, and both both of you guys the 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 visuals and the music and the score in the background and everything it feels like it just keeps asking you to look for the beauty. It's almost not even relevant. It's, it almost doesn't matter what the picture is because the score keeps asking you 
consider where the beauty is. Consider where the beauty is. You talk about the playground, Vincent, and there's that shot of the uh, overgrown playground with the bees yeah. and the flowers. And, yeah. you know, it's like really, it's kind of really beautiful. It's hard to think of it as, you know, depressing. I, I think that's <laughs> somebody who's really completely yeah. missing the mark. No, but I think, I I, I mean, they're missing the mark. I, I think, uh, I I don't think they're entirely missing the mark. I think they're valid. I I do, I do understand where they're coming from when they say. I don't think they're saying it with cruel intentions. Sure. Um, but like I, I'll say, I just want to back up for a second and say that the the point of the memory was uh, the point of using the memory and kind of like getting this dream, this dream like quality, um, like that was that was sort of inherently necessary or to like it was inherent inherently necessary to use these tools i think i think there there are no other tools out there that that has like this sort of memory shaping dreamy quality to it um um as like the backbone of it you know what i'm saying like it, yeah. it like it, it's sort of it ai the way i look at it when you look at something like stable diffusion, for example, it is dreaming in its own way. Um, because what is a dream? A dream is a collection of experiences and sort of it trying to make sense of itself like that. That's what it's working to do. And at least that's how I see dreams. And all AI is, is a program that you're just giving input. You're, you're feeding experiences you're feeding images you're feeding whatever you can feed into it and it's trying to figure itself out so so creating these images um at the beginning of it did have this sense of trying to figure itself out but um we eventually had to tack on different compositioning to it different um compositing things to it different um tool different uh, like i spent probably like 10 percent ai and the rest of 90 percent was me carving away at this thing trying to trying to shape it to something that i saw as true um but just to jump on to the the person saying like that park scene for example that you know to me growing up going to an overgrown park was the most fun probably the right most fun i've ever had yeah um yeah. You, the especially when i grew up i feel like for some reason <clears throat> the amount of birds and the amount of bugs that existed has like declined dramatically i'm sure a lot of people feel that way in this like in the city but uh you know i remember going around seeing just creatures i've i never knew existed um and meeting them in their space in these overgrown playgrounds um and it's funny that it's it's like a playground that's not being used the way it was probably intended to be used, but at least the kids are still having fun in it. And that's yeah. that's kind of the beauty of of this kind of project where like out of context you might view these images and yeah, there might be something kind of bleak about an overgrown overgrown playground with nobody in it. But that's the that's the thing is that you're trying to convey a, a subjective experience, you know, one person's experience of this place and how it was seen through their eyes at a certain point in life, at a certain age. Um, yeah. Yeah, what That's was amazing. interesting, what was interesting was finding, <laughs> I hate that it was 12 minutes long. That's the, that's the length of the film, um, but it was necessary. I even finding, finding that time frame to have a clip go all the way through was interesting because it was like, <clears throat> I wanted it to be enough that the viewer sits within the experience and actually like feels like they're planted in that space. Um, but I wanted it to be small enough that, you know, we can get through the whole, <laughs> get through the whole film in a, in a timely manner. So it was like interesting finding that, that nice spot where you actually feel like, okay, I'm, I'm here in this park, you know, that was really an interesting. It was also in, in our first meeting discussing, the film this this was one of the really interesting uh, bits of direction that you gave me was you know we, we spent about 30 seconds on each one of these frames and one of the interesting things that Vincent said was don't feel that it has to go anywhere emotionally we just sort of sit there yeah. we're just sort of observing and experiencing this place and that really helped sort of frame how I was gonna try and you know 
move energy through the people. Yeah. So, Yaron, I, I remember you speaking because you, you both spoke after the screening, and uh, it was really fascinating to me when you talked about uh, overlapping, you know, some of your words and vocals uh, in, in that. I, I believe it was that um, one shot <laughs> of the static chairs and you hear this almost distant memory of the people that used to sit in those chairs and sing. And you had mentioned that some of those were your voices that you had overlaid and overlaid. That's a, a pretty brilliant approach, I think, to creating something like that. Yeah. So, uh, so when we were talking about this, this idea of, of a ghost town and, you know, sort of like ghosts of people, ghosts of industry, ghosts of music, just sort of like imagining the, the life that used to exist in these places that are now sort of a little bit run down. Um, one of the things that, that we thought would be interesting was to, you know, at, at some point during the film to actually imagine maybe some actual literal scenarios. So, you know, so when we have those yeah. four chairs to the side of the road and, you know, Vincent was talking about imagining the, the people who maybe once sat in those chairs, I thought, you know, you know, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be cool if at some point people were just sort of sat there to the side of the road and they were singing a little bit of like a cappella music and, um, and I wasn't really sure what these people would necessarily sound like. I just had a feeling that they wouldn't sound like me. So, <laughs> So for that moment, we did use um, AI voice cloning to sort of transform those voices slightly um, and give them, you know, a slightly different quality. Uh, also used AI to sort of lean into the whole uh, blurry memory, sort of like using all sorts of like degradation tools to, to try and bring that sort of retro vibe. Um, yeah, that, that, was, that was one of the tools uh, that we used. You know, we also used uh, AI instrument cloning. We did have some live musicians play on the score as well, but we, we used, um, instrument cloning for all sorts of, uh, you know, saxophone wow. sounds and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting to, to explore the capabilities. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, really, really well done. I'm a fan. Hats off. Thanks, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I want to point out though, you know, that even though I feel like I know you, you, your idea was to kind of step back and let and let AI do its thing. But you, you know, the whole reason why I knew this collaboration would work and why I wanted it, why I wanted it in the first place was because I want, and I think I told you this in the first, in the first go around, but like, I was like, I want you, like, I didn't give you too much direction. We, we talked about it and I was like, I want you to sort of have your, as an artist, have your stake in this as well. Um, that was really important to me because at the time AI was still, was like still having its like bad word era. Uh, I think it still isn't sort of in that era, but it's getting a little bit better. Uh, so my point was like, okay, we're, we're both artists. I want you to, to invest your art into this as, as, you know, equally as much as I am. And I think that voice cloning bit is like the biggest example of that. And I think it's, it's really kind of beautiful to even though you're you're showcasing you know some ai voice work but it's you still and it's a part of you that'll live on in the film yeah um in a in a diff, maybe in a different way yeah. than than it would have otherwise you you probably would have um in a normal circumstance in a non-ai film probably would have cast some some voice you know sure. some voice artists sure. and stuff. so it's cool that but it's like you know you're tackling from it you're t you're you know attaching um you're going at it from a sonic you know perspective i'm going at it from a visual perspective and as artists we created something different something new um in a, in a new way so yeah i, th I think it's beautiful man. Yeah. and i should say to clarify there in terms of the score there isn't actually any um ai generated music in terms of like the actual composition so uh, the tools that I used on this were more for sort of sound shaping and sound experimentation than actually writing music. Not that I have um, anything against that. I just think that in terms of the, the quality, it's not quite there yet. Um, I right. haven't found yet that, that I'm able to use AI to actually generate um, like core musical building blocks. Um, it's not really where it, at the stage that image generation is quite yet. It'll probably get there, but it's not there quite yet. 
Yeah, probably tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do they call it? What is the term when it does things that make no sense? Uh, Vincent, is it hallucination? Is that the yeah. term? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly Crazy. it. Oh, yeah. AI when, when the AI misbehaves, do you like the... Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Weird hands and eyes cool. and stuff. So, you know, I think we touched on this a little bit, but, you know, I just want to circle back because I felt like watching this from my perspective, there was a lot of hope and optimism. Uh, mm. So, Yarn, when you were doing that, it was that intentional? Was that organic? How, how did that how did that work for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, one of the things that that Vincent was sort of keen on and that he mentioned was that it, it wouldn't uh, even though these places look sort of abandoned and, and kind of run down is that it wouldn't be depressing and that it wouldn't feel, you know, ominous or dark in any way is just like this happens to be the place that he grew up in. And, you know, he, mm -hmm. he mentioned with, especially with some of these images and some of these frames, a sort of sense of adventure, you know, this abandoned home that they used to go and, uh, and like, play and mess around in or, or, you know, a rundown church where they used to go and, and, and shout and like listen to their echoes bouncing off the walls. And just to sort of the, I, I saw the role of score in this to recreate that emotional experience and to sort of bring that point of view um, of, you know, this really not being bleak and not sort of focusing on uh, on the emptiness, but more of what it is, what experiences filled those empty spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you, there's even visually, there's always little hints of it. You know, you got that alley with the muddy streets, or that one shot through the the camera in the car shooting through the window. Brilliant. That was my and, favorite. Yeah, That's... yeah, really, really brilliant. You know, and you'd like yeah. uh, like it was cool. I don't want to be there. I didn't want to be there, but then you have the park and you have like, you know, that rooftop shot with the clouds moving overhead and your final shot with like the idyllic house and the idyllic street, which, you yeah. know, Vince, I want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like it's like, this is also what this is. And this is also its potential. Yeah. I mean, you know, there could be a whole, e each frame has its own entire story behind it, um, which is very very fascinating but um for instance that car shot um <laughs> that you say you don't want to be in it's actually from when i was a young kid um i was like really young i had to be like like six or like five or six or something um and my mother worked at a at as a um as a security guard at some I can't remember where, but she worked as a security guard. It was the late night shift. Like she worked at the, the midnight shift. And so there were times when, you know, for some reason or the other, we didn't have a babysitter. And so mm -hmm. I was literally just put in the car and she's like out there working and I'm just sitting, sitting in the car. Like we didn't have phones. I didn't know what a phone was. I'm, I'm yeah. old, you know? <laughs> um, and so we, I'm sitting out there looking at the car, looking at the trucks drive by the early morning, you know, things start up. Um, and that's sort of what was inspired for that moment, inspired by that moment. I, I think it's, to me, it was very, it was beautiful. It was like, it was the perfect temperature, you know, it was, it was a moment of quiet. Um, I knew she was right outside the door, you know what I mean? So like, it was, to me, it was a happy memory. Um, and it looks, it probably looks scary to some, <laughs> um, but it was beautiful. It, moments like that is scattered throughout the story. You know, it, the church, even though it's run down, you know, that was a, that was a, our clubhouse, you know, that's yeah, where you yeah. go to, to just hang out, kick it with your, your homies and, and be rambunctious little kids, you know? So yeah. every, every moment in the story had was from a, from a point of, of beauty and, 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 and happy memories. That's cool. That's cool. I think the honesty of that really comes through. And, you know, um, since, you know, we do keep calling this a love story. I wanted to ask you, Vincent, has your family seen this film? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. They've seen the film. Um, do they get all, as warm and fuzzy as I am, or is it just too obvious for them? I mean, you know, this is, 
Detroit from early early two thousands, late nineties, from my perspective. Yeah, you know. So it's it's like it's like. It, <laughs> You know, my mom probably has a different memory of being in that security guard booth than Great point. I do. You know what I mean? Great point. Um, so it's it's all about perspective and everyone's individual. Um, I think it's it probably is more impactful to people outside of Detroit. I remember a few times um people would walk up to me and say, you know, after watching your film, I realized I've never seen a picture of Detroit before. You know, like this was this was people's gateway into my city. So it was really I think it's I think that's more of the impact. Um, Detroiters will watch it and just be like, what what is what am right. I watching right now? <laughs> right. I could turn around and there it is. Why am I watching this? That's yeah. funny. I know. I know. Ask a fish about water. Exactly. Um, so, you know, I, I just have to say one of the things I was going to tell you, because it didn't occur to me until we were having this conversation. But when I was a kid, we had a, a, a property that was probably two houses down from us that back in the day used to be a mansion. Okay. And it was like two full city blocks. Yeah. But when I was coming up, it was completely abandoned. There was just a yeah. cement frame. There was a fountain, which used to be in the gar backyard. Sure. And just like your park shot, it was just high Overground. weeds and stuff yeah. like that. And yeah. just like you, we couldn't wait to go out there and yeah. grab trash can lids and have rock fights. Yeah. And yeah. It was a blast. You know what I mean? Yeah. But Well, so that's that's interesting because it's like reclaiming, you know? Like right now, I think you don't have a lot of kids out playing outside. At least that's what it looks like. Um, and I think that that's a different, a lot of different reasons why, you know, the sure. state of the world and all that stuff. But like, um, you know, there's something to the, like growing up in the city, as you know, is a little bit different. You know, we, 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 as kids, we're, unless it's abandoned, unless adults aren't watching it and guarding it. You know, we're told we're if they're watching it and guarding it, we're told not to touch it, not to get involved with it, not to engage with it as children. But if it's if it's not being watched, um, then we turn it into our playground, which is what what it should be anyways. You know, we're, we're sort of uh, this is the reason why I don't want to raise my kids in a city. You know, I think yeah. I think the world should feel a little bit more open to play um and yeah. this is a, a whole other conversation but it I, totally I just, is i just think that play is for children and and for adults is very important and i think when you when you grow up in a place like you said that that abandoned area where it's just like a free-for-all and you have space and and you can hide things seem bigger than than they are and because you're kidding you're smaller i think that that kind of environment is terribly important for children yeah yeah it was full of wonder and you know i think somebody from the outside looking at it be like oh my god he's playing yeah. in an empty lot you know? yeah and for us is like that was our owner at nine years old i own this like, yeah it's mine you know what i mean you're stumping so it's just you know yeah. it's a it's just a completely different perspective but that but building like, in our neighborhood they had to eventually grease up so we would stop climbing all over it <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a challenge yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Um, uh, and so like, let me ask you, and this is a question for both of you with this tech, now that you guys have, you've touched it and tasted it. Uh, how do you think going forward on your own projects, you're going to incorporate? Oh, fun question. Oh my gosh. Do you want to take it first? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think all I, I try to stay up to date with with everything that's happening in music and AI, and and all the indications that I'm seeing is that this year is going to be a pretty big year for um, AI uh, music related tools, and mm. I think what's really interesting is that the focus is sort of starting to shift from these kind of uh, early stage music generation tools that we've been seeing that were sort of aimed at uh, like the general user and were kind of gimmicky and very sort of like derivative in sound and more aimed at like, yeah. you know, uh, imitating, imitation. 
It's one of those things where you have to get it out of my yeah, system, right? Yeah, it's like, absolutely. oh, this it's, is fun. It's, it's, go ahead. Go ahead and do it's it. It's early days. There's a lot of experimentation going on. I think now what's interesting is that there's starting to be more tools sort of aimed at at musicians and aimed at sort of like the professional sector. And it's really interesting the the kinds of things that have started popping up. So like, for instance, you know, if you're listening to music and, and, and you're hearing any sort of element that's been synthesized, so like a synthesizer or like electronic drums or something like that, that would involve someone, you know, sitting down and knowing these tools inside out and programming them. What we're starting to see now is that you start getting all these uh, sound design tools that are prompt based. So if you have the, the, the creative inclination, but you don't necessarily have all the technical know-how, you can now have, um, you know, a much broader uh, gate into, into this kind of uh, sound design and that sort of thing that's going on. Um, I do also think that that end-to-end -end music generation is going to improve. Um, I don't yet see it getting to the point where, where it might be usable for um, things like score, because that's, you know, a very, it's where music is serve, serving a very sort of narrative function and has to change a lot. Um, over time in order to, to convey whatever it is you're trying to do with story. But I mean, in three months time, I'm probably going to eat these words that I just said, right? Because things are moving so fast. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting to, to sort of have uh, your finger on the pulse of, of what's happening now and like see all these new tools that are, that are emerging um, and into yeah. using. Smart. Smart. Yeah. Vincent? I, I'd say this is a, a huge question um, because as an artist, I think you have to decide for yourself what not to use these sort of tools for. Um, yeah, nice. I've, you know, I'm a writer and director first, um, a writer first even. Um, and I, you know, out of the gate, I knew that I wouldn't want to use these sort of tools for for writing um and i've been i haven't tried to use it but people who have <laughs> and i see the work and i'm just like yeah you're not convincing me you know like it's it's not it's not there and i i personally don't think it will ever get there to a point where you can write uh, a screenplay uh with ai um although <laughs> you're gonna see people try and for like sure. Yaren said, you you know, I might be eating my words soon, but I, I just don't see that being something that people will want to see. Uh, on the visual side of things, um, sort of like in sort of like you were describing in the music space, um, it's sort of trickling down into into just sp very specific tools that you can use in very specific ways. Um, you've right now it's right now, the best area that I could see these tools, um, being utilized in is animation. Mm -hmm. Animation is a, is quite a feat as we all know, it takes years for these, for, for animated films to come into existence. Um, and that's because there's a lot of manpower, a lot of work that has to go into it. And where AI can come in is it can shorten that time for people. Um, sure, jobs will be condensed, but I think that happens with technologies regardless. regardless. Um, and I think that it's up to these artists, these animation artists, <laughs> to get a hold of, wrangle these tools and use them just as Photoshop was when it was first introduced. They had to get a hold of that and, and, and then so on. There are many, you know, many of these types of technologies that come in and change up the space that way. Um, and in narrative live action specifically, um, it's, it's a great way to, to, um, manipulate images in a sense of, you know, I can, I can now, there are like the best use cases I've seen so far is now you can go in and expand your uh, set, set expansion, set extension. Mm -hmm. um, you can now change your environments, your backgrounds. Um, these are very helpful tools for especially indie filmmakers. Um, you go into a space as an indie filmmaker, you might not have the biggest budget, but you can be anywhere on the world. Um, and you can, 
you can cheat things easily. These are great for cinematographers. Um, there, are, there are good masking options, instant masking, um, which is very helpful for post-production workflows. You know, there's like a lot of specific use cases um, that are kind of uh, blossoming and I think magnificent ways, but it, the, the, the point of all of this is that it's all on the back end. These are, these are all things that occur after the art has already taken place. So as a filmmaker, it's like, you know, you create the story, you create the vision, um, and, and these tools come in after the fact, just like other post-production tools to help you achieve, um, the final output, the final vision. Yeah. I think, I think it's interesting, like to continue on what Wisdom said, it's, it's interesting to, it's important to, um, keep sight of the fact that as artists, what we want to be doing is to make our art and to tell our story and to convey our perspective. These are just new tools that are now at our disposal. You know, like the, the, the zeitgeisty conversation happening now is how can these tools be, you know, independent and do their own thing. And that's, yeah, you know, that conversation is going to be happening for like two, three years with every new thing and, you know, fine, whatever. But at the end yeah. of the day, the, what's really interesting is to how, you know, these tools are going to be used at our disposal and to service our arts and, and what it is that we're trying to do. And also to, to, to sort of continue on what Vincent was saying in terms of what tools you are going to be using and what tools you're not going to be using. It's not uh, just a question of um, what it is that you see as your role and what it is that you need uh, or, or would like to use complementary tools for. Um, I would also say that as more and more of these tools emerge, there's also um, a broadening spectrum regarding the transparency of how these tools are being created and how these models are being trained. And um, for instance, with voice cloning, there's some companies that you know are, are very transparent about how they collaborate with their original you know voice artists on whom the models are are based and and you know, offering compensation and that kind of thing, and some sort of residual structure for if you want to use these things commercially. And then there are other companies that that aren't really as transparent. And I think it's really important to, that that we as users sort of make that distinction. And it's incumbent upon us to sort of clarify to to these companies making these tools now that we do actually care about how the sausage is made. You know. Um, mm. And so that, yeah. that's another yeah. thing that I would say in terms of what tools we're deciding to use and what tools we're deciding not to use is that it's kind of a wild west now in terms of like the regulation and, and it's all, you know, very new. And we want to make sure that that all these tools are being created fairly and they're being used fairly. Um, so that's another thing, you know, to keep in mind going forward yeah. with these technologies. Yeah, I, I want to jump on that real quick and just say, you know, I feel like I'm also just using less and less um image generation i think i think image generation was which was great for this film for this film um in particular um but it's not it's not something that i see myself using a lot going forward um for instance we're we're actually working on our first over at rzc we're working on our first um uh, animated series a uh, group of us we've got you know we've got a writer's room we've got a modeler we've got an un unreal team working with motion capture um we've you know we're slowly building out our team and and what's fun about it is that the the impetus for this whole thing was the fact that okay we can create an animation using having AI kind of be this rotoscoping tool at the very end of it, just to give us this, this certain look that we want. Um, <laughs> but it's funny that up to this point, we have not used AI at all. Uh, it's all been artists from creating the, the creatures, from creating the, the characters. Every, everything has been artist driven, uh, which has been really fun. Um, but it, I just think it's it's a little ironic that it started from this place of, oh, look, we can make our own animations. <laughs> Let's dive into it. Okay, now we're basically learning animation during this process the, the traditional way. So it's just, it's like, it's like I, I really don't see the fun, honestly, in creating something with 
all AI yeah. tech, I think it's way more interesting. And it's a thousand times more interesting to collaborate with artists. Um, and, you know, I think that's the, that's the crux of it. It doesn't matter what the frame is. It still needs us to show up and put something in it, right? Yeah. Sure. And also, and also, you know, to remember that just because we might all have access to these tools now, it doesn't mean we get to have one another's artistic sensibilities. You know, like I can, I can probably learn, you know, mid journey and runway and, and, and make something that might even be decent, but it won't be like, you know, the kind of stuff that Vincent does is because he's a but, filmmaker. Yeah. And that's a right. whole that world and a whole skill set in and of itself. You know, people, That's people right. kind of think, you know, oh, you know, AI, so anyone can do anything now. Yeah. Not, not the yeah. case. We, we, still, we still value the artistic sensibilities of the artists 100%. actually coming in. And, you know, like, just because I have access now to instrument coding and I can sing something and have it output in the saxophone sound doesn't mean that I get to have, you know, the artistic sensibility of Coltrane, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'll still yeah, bring yeah. in a, a musician, not just for the sound that their instrument creates, but for their perspective and what it is that they're yeah. doing to create a process. It's about that collaboration. That collaboration is that collaboration is a piece of the art that like it's like an invisible piece that no one really discusses. But like if you if you take that out, it would be like if I if, if Vincent, I made that short film and then I also composed it it would probably sound like shit, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but like, but you know, I, I think the joy, that joy, that, that, that collaboration, that spirit, um, has to be there. And without it, it's, it's a, it's like, why do it in the first place? I think that's the, and then once, once you encroach onto that, once you get to that level of, of not caring about a project, you will not have an audience. I want to stress that to your viewer. It, to your viewers, if anybody is going into this um, for the sake of just they're they're gonna go into AI and just build something in AI, if it's if it's careless in the sense of lack of collaboration, lack of this this point of view, um, your audience will not connect, will not have a reason to connect with it. I see, I personally because I'm running like the film festival the generative imaging field festival which i'm very proud to to run and i i want to continue this journey of building stories using this stuff um as tools um i see a lot of films come my way a lot of student projects and and most of it you know 70 percent of it lack a purpose soul. lack a point of view lack a soul because they're just playing with it. And that's that's fair in its own right. They're experimenting. Yes. But but you have to have something behind it. It has to it has to come from a place, it has to come from a point of view, from an artistic place, I think. It still requires storytelling. Yeah. That's amazing. Yep. That's amazing. Um well let's uh let's close there. Uh is there anything else um you guys want to mention or talk yes. about? Yes. Absolutely. Um, yeah. For anyone listening, if you if you use any of these tools um, in any way, um, whether that's from rotoscoping to masking um, to upresing, um, even in even in music, uh, I welcome you to to submit to uh, GIF uh, G I F F. It's Generative Imaging Film Festival. Uh, it's going to be an annual project. Uh, where we celebrate artist-driven storytelling using these tools. Um, that's the only precursor to it. It just has to be a story. Um, nice. And I welcome you to to uh, find that at uh, realaipirate.com. We'll have the info up where you can go ahead and, and submit to that. Absolutely. I'll put that in the show notes, too. Uh, and Yaron, where can people find you? Um, yeah, so uh, so I'm I'm happy if anyone wants to check out my work at yaronagenstein.com. Um, cool. Yeah, and uh, other than that, I would just I would just end by saying um, I think a lot of people are slightly you know worried about about these tools and what they might be bringing, what they might be taking away. I would say the the train is moving anyway. So yeah. if you can, that's if sure. you can replace fear with curiosity, 
not just for the sake of yeah. you know your own <laughs> survival or whatever but but for for the sake of your own enjoyment um i would suggest that as an approach trade your fear for curiosity i am stealing that i'm using That's that beautiful. all the time um <laughs> i hope you own it and get residuals for that but i am definitely going to repeat that. go for it it's yours <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you gentlemen very, very much for being on today and making the time. Thanks for having me. Great film. You guys should be thank very you. proud of what you've done. I really loved it. And it was exciting for me to sort of come full circle, meet Vincent, meet you, Yaron, after see the film. So this has been a, this has been a real treat for me. So I really appreciate the time and I look forward to what you guys do next. Amazing. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for having us on. Anytime, anytime. Take care. All right. Bye.